To become mindful is to become free, to have the capacity to step out of the rat race, the speed, the complexity, and be who we are, be true to our hearts. And there comes a great balance and ease with that. In any moment, we stop the war, we stop the conflict, we come back to be as the Buddha sits, as the Buddha walks, as the Buddha speaks, where we are, just present and alive. Hello, and welcome back to Jack Kornfield's Heart Wisdom Podcast on the Be Here Now Network. I'm Ganesh, honored to welcome you into episode 249, Mindfulness, the Gateway to Liberation. This is part two of last week's episode, coming from March 1st, 1992 at Spirit Rock Meditation Center. And while this does stand completely on its own in its topic and its length, if you would like the full experience of this Jack Hornfield talk, please head back last week to Living the Dharma. This episode is an instant classic and a true guidebook for finding freedom in the timeless present moment. One of the more beautiful things that Jack shares is how we can step out of the bureaucracy of ego, thought, and mind by using mindfulness to identify with the witness rather than our constant stream of discursive thoughts. A quite pertinent quote that came through that just really touches on what's happening in the world today and a situation that arose in my life is Jack shared, to become mindful is to become free, to have the capacity to step out of the rat race, the speed, the complexity, and be who we are, be true to our hearts. There comes a great balance and ease with that. In any moment, we stop the war, we stop the conflict, we come back to be as the Buddha sits, as the Buddha walks, as the Buddha speaks, where we are, just present and alive. And in this rather fiery election season, in this time period where there's wars raging across the planet, what a better skill, what a better ability to work on than being able to imbibe mindfulness to stop the war, to stop that conflict. Jack mentions the speed, the speed of the rat race. In this society where we have to move really fast and social media is just bombarding us left and right, and the news is telling us to think quickly and act quickly, and we have fast food and microwaves, it's really hard not to get caught up in all of that momentum. Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche described speed as a form of aggression. And I know that when I slow down, my thoughts are racing very fast and I take a moment and I start doing my mala and breathing. Everything slows down. The aggression or the frustration in my mind starts to dissolve away into that spaciousness. And anytime we get caught up, if we can remember to slow down, take a moment and slow down those thoughts, we would cut down on our aggression, even if subtle, and we can begin the process of healing the world through ourself. And Jack shares a story in here about a Zen master who was dying and he brought all of his students in because he knew he was gonna be suffering at some point and if his students saw, how would they react to their great teacher, this Buddha in pain. So he called them in and said, I will be dying soon. And there may be suffering involved in the dying. And I, in that, am suffering Buddha. That's just suffering Buddha. This is another face of Buddha, of God, of reality. This reminds me of last fall when I went to a concert at an amphitheater in the mountains and accidentally found myself at uh, Chogim Trumpa Rinpoche's Drala Mountain Center, formerly Shambhala Mountain Center. And I walk up the mountain past the stupa and below a bunch of Tibetan prayer flags flailing in the wind were probably 30 to 50 statues of these little Buddhas and they all had different faces on them. I had never seen anything quite like that. Generally, when you see the Buddha, there is that grin, that 
subtle expression of peace and bliss on his face. But this, there are some Murti's statues with happy faces. There are some with sad. There are some bent over. There are some crying out. There are some talking to each other. I was like, what is this? I was really contemplating what would this mean? And the story that Jack shared now almost a year later for me gave me the answer. This is a full human experience we're having. And we hit all the different emotions and thoughts and planes. And our practice, our job is to not run away from these things, to, to hold them in our hearts with mindfulness and be able to accept in the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows of our human experience. And that, I believe, is what those Buddha statues were meant to showcase. And that is what Jack shares here in this beautiful podcast. So I'll just offer some quick housekeeping here so you can keep up to date with what Jack has going on. September 2nd is his next Spirit Rock Monday Night Dharma Talk and Meditation. This will be a live stream and is pay what you can, so please come. And then something very special I'll actually be traveling in for. Jack will be doing a workshop with Trudy Goodman, his beloved, called Love and Relationships, the Great Spiritual Practice. This will be on land and online at Spirit Rock on September 28th. You can sign up for both of these events at jackhornfield.com slash events. And other than that, I invite you to cozy up and enjoy this wonderful podcast. Episode 249, Mindfulness, the Gateway to Liberation with Jack Cornfield. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you help others through the authenticity of your being. And may your heart be smiling. Namaste. Over the past eight weeks, we have gone through the fundamental Buddhist teachings of the Eightfold Path, which is the path laid out in the very first teachings of the Buddha, also called the Middle Path, <clears throat> the path of balance between, perfect balance between detachment and attachment neither detached nor attached but perfectly in the midst of things as they are and this path which is an invitation for those who would follow it to discover a liberation of heart begins with what's called right or wise understanding to see suffering and its causes in the world and to see the possibility in our own hearts of greater compassion and greater freedom, to know that that's possible in us. And then wise aspiration, which is the openness and intention to direct our lives to this possibility of freedom and compassion. Then right speech, right action, right livelihood, which means living in words and deeds in a conduct that creates harmony inwardly and outwardly. And then right or wise effort, which is really the effort to be, to pay attention, to be where we are in a full and present and wakeful way, um, to see when we're entangled and to release that. And last week started to speak of the two last steps of the Eightfold Path, which are wise concentration and wise mindfulness, wise mindfulness, concentration. Last week spoke of concentration. So tonight, the conclusion is right mindfulness or wise mindfulness. And mindfulness, it's better pronounced. Fullness of mind. Sati is the word in the ancient Buddhist language of Pali. Mindfulness, said the Buddha, I declare, is all helpful. In every situation, the quality of mindfulness, of listening, of awareness, of remembering, of what one might call a sacred attention to life, is what brings us to awakening. The art of living, as Alan Watts said, is neither careless drifting on the one hand, nor fearful clinging on the other. It consists in being completely sensitive to each moment, regarding it utterly new and unique, having the mind and heart open, 
and truly receptive. And this is the quality of mindfulness. Now, if we look at our lives, our daily experience, with the people around us, where we live, where we work, how we move, we discover as human beings that we can be asleep while we're awake. You know, the life that's on automatic pilot. We can be identified and caught up with things, entangled in them, grasping for pleasures over and over, avoiding what's unpleasant. And we can be asleep in relation to our own bodies, not attentive or aware, in relation to our feelings, to our children, or our lovers, or our parents. We can be asleep to the injustices of the world, to the war, or racism, or hunger, the needs of those around us. All of that we can just block out. Or we can pay attention. I remember some years ago being at the Menninger Foundation in Kansas, invited to an international conference on the nature of consciousness. And there were all these presentations by various psychologists and psychiatrists and religious experts and so forth about the nature of mind. And finally, it was time for one of the invitees to address the group. His name was Mad Bear. He was a Iroquois Indian medicine man. And he said, I can't speak in here. Come with me. And he led the whole group outside. And we were in this retreat center that was in the midst of the Great Plains of Kansas. And he had to stand in a circle and first just stand silent for a long time. And then after that great silence under this big, huge, Midwestern, vast sky surrounded by the grains that just went out to the horizon, he began to offer a prayer, a prayer of gratitude. And he thanked first the earthworms for aerating the soil so that the plants could grow. And then he thanked the grasses that cover the earth for keeping the dust from blowing and for cushioning our steps and for showing our eyes their greenness and beauty and nourishing the creatures that live on them. And he thanked the wind for bringing rain and for cleaning the air and for giving us the life breath that connects us to all things. And then he thanked the trees for cradling the birds and granting us shade and filling the air that the winds carry with sweet oxygen that fills our bodies and refreshes us. And then he thanked the stones for the foundation they give under our feet for the steps of our life, the stones for remembering the ancestors, for holding the memories of human beings. And he thanked the birds for singing to us, for showing us that the spirit can fly, for singing when we're happy and for singing when we're sad and keep singing anyway. And he went on and on for a long time, probably an hour of prayers while we're standing out there. And, you know, we we're there and the wind was blowing in our faces and the sun was beating down and the insects, it was summertime, were making all their buzzing noises and the, and the rain was, was blowing. And by the end of it, the whole conference was in an entirely different place than all those scientific words about consciousness. They were kind of erased and swept away. And what it was, was a, it was a practice of mindfulness. It was the mindfulness of sacred attention. Mindfulness in the Buddhist tradition, mindfulness is said to be the gateway to liberation, the gateway to that which is eternal, to the timeless or the deathless. And when we get entangled in our thoughts, in our worries, in our imaginings, in our fears, author and psychiatrist Robert Hallowell finds that most people call themselves moderate to severe worriers in America. I don't know who he's talking about, but you can guess, huh? Right. When we get entangled in all these imaginings of how it's supposed to be and could be and the feelings and fears and thoughts and so forth, mindfulness allows us to let go of that and come into the reality of the present 
as the Buddha said, do not pursue the past and do not long for yourself, lose yourself in the future, but rest where you are here and now. The past no longer exists. The future is yet to come. And in this present moment, you will find the freedom that is who you really are. So mindfulness is the practice of being here in the present, wherever we are. The poem that you've heard many times, but it captures it so well, it's worth another reading from Rumi. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Treat each guest honorably, his words. So mindfulness is really an invitation to be present and to be alive. And to discover in this aliveness a freedom of heart and spirit that is our true nature, the space of awareness. The text of the foundations of mindfulness. What is right mindfulness, my friends? The Blessed One went on, there is a most wonderful way for living beings to realize purification, overcome directly grief and sorrow, end pain and anxiety, and travel the path of wakefulness and compassion. And this is the establishment of mindfulness. My friends, a practitioner establishes awareness of the body in the body, diligent, clear, understanding, having abandoned both grasping and distaste, seeing things as they are, establishes awareness of feelings in the feelings, of mind in the mind, and awareness of the Dharma or the laws of life in the Dharma. One goes to a quiet place and sits oneself down and establishes awareness of the breath, breathing in and out, long or short. And after awareness of the breathing, one becomes aware of the movement of the body, standing up, sitting down, lying down, taking food. One becomes aware of the feelings as they arise and pass away, of the states of mind, when the mind is contracted, when the mind is released, when the mind is fearful, when the mind is at peace. One becomes aware of the laws that govern this mind and body. How to practice mindfulness. The body in the body is a place for our attention. We are embodied beings kind of amazing that you get a body, but here you are, you know, and you don't even get to decide what it's going to look like exactly. You kind of push the button and boom, there you come in to this incarnation or whatever you call it, this birth, and look at that. Wow, huh? I was born in this family. Maybe better luck next time, right? But it is only through attention to this fact of our body that we can learn who we really are not by running away or ignoring it. It's only by attention that we can heal it and respect it and honor it and use it as a vehicle for ourselves, for others. Again, the words of the Buddha. Those who do not partake of the deathless do not partake of mindfulness of the body. The timeless, the eternal, the deathless is lost to those who have no mindfulness directed to their own body. It is actually by paying attention to the life we're given that we can find that which is eternal or beyond this life. Because if you look at your own body, 
start to give it a mindful attention, there's tension in it and conflict that we carry, and there's the release of that. There's change in the body. There's aging, have you noticed? There's caring for the body. And you can say, oh, no, I don't want to pay attention. I don't want to look. I don't want to see. But whether you observe or not, it has its own life. To bring mindfulness to the body in the body is to bring our mind and heart and body together so that we can know the wisdom of this life. And the more closely you tend to your body and senses, the more alive they become instead of being someplace else in an imagined life, our tastes, our smells, our senses, the reality of this life will teach us. You know, when Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen master, has come to teach at Spirit Rock, he usually comes in the summer, and we've had two or 3,000 people out on the hillside, a whole gathering of people for his presence, and they'll do some chanting, and they'll do some meditation, and maybe they'll do a meditation of eating an apple or an orange mindfully. He's kind of the king of mindfulness or something like that. Everybody's sitting there, happy, chattering away. It's kind of like the Grateful Dead concert, only quieter, right? In some way, you know. And then all of a sudden, it's time for, it's not Jerry Garcia, it's time for Thich Nhat Hanh to come on. You know, he's usually somewhere meditating or whatever he does. Who knows? And he comes out. And there's these two or three thousand people sitting there, and Thich Nhat Hanh walks out, and he walks so mindfully each step he takes. And he looks up so mindfully, and he smiles so mindfully, and he sits down so mindfully, and he takes the microphone so mindfully, and then closes his eyes and breathes a little bit so mindfully. Everybody changes. Just He doesn't even have to say a word. Just by the way that he walks in, the quality of attention he gives to his steps, to his body, to the earth, changes the whole environment of everybody else's consciousness. It's what it means to really pay attention to this body. And when we do, instead of fighting against it and wanting it to be different and filled with desire and aversion and lost in things, the more deeply we pay attention, the more we can honor the body and care for it properly, and the more also we see that it is always in change. If you sit in meditation and your body hurts, there's a pain, you say, oh, that's pain, I want to get rid of it, and you move, you go away from it. Oh, the children are coming, oh, well, nice. You hear the sounds coming? Good. But pain is just a word. What is pain? You pay attention. Oh, it's tingling, it's throbbing, it's vibration, it's heat, it's fire, it's twisting. And the more deeply we pay attention, pain becomes a whole world, a river of sensations. And pleasure, oh, this is joy. But what does joy feel like in the body? Some of us are afraid of joy. Oh, I expand, there's this a different kind of tingling. There's pleasure, there's light, there's ease. We have the names for things, but the more deeply we feel, we discover that what we are is a river of life, and we can enter and rest in that river. Also, as you pay attention, when you feel the pain or the feelings or the joy, after a while, you begin to realize that it's not just your pain, and it's not just your joy or happiness, and it's not just your feelings, but it's the body in the body, the feelings in the feelings. It's the feeling. It's the pain that human beings have. It's the joy that human beings share. It is the life that we have been given. To be mindful of the body brings us freedom. Freedom to be where we are, freedom to care with compassion, and also freedom not to be afraid of this body for what it is. To be mindful of feelings is the same. To practice mindfulness of body in the body, to practice mindfulness of feeling in the feeling, means to be aware of what we feel without reacting so much. 
somebody crying, is that what it is? Or are they just laughing? The kids playing? Can't even tell, can you? Mm. When we're not aware and pleasant arises, we tend to say, oh, pleasant, I want more of it. We cling, we grasp, we want more and more and more. When unpleasant arises and we're not aware, we tend to withdraw and shrink away and move. Oh, aversion, I don't like this. How do I get rid of it? And so we spend our lives trying to avoid half of life and trying to grasp the other half all the time off balance. When we become aware of feelings, pleasant, neutral, unpleasant, the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows, then we are free. Without awareness of body, without awareness of feelings, we cannot be present. We cannot be free. So you sit or walk in meditation and love comes or pride comes or delight comes or worry comes, or grief comes. Someone said that in some way spiritual life, to really be free, spiritual life is a long process of grieving, of seeing all the ways that we wanted it to be, and then realizing that it is the way that it is. Some years ago, in New York City, there was a professional seminar given by the senior analyst of the Jung Institute to show, together with Marie-Louise von Franz, who made a series of wonderful movies about the nature of dreams, one of Jung's great disciples. And this panel of analysts then sat up there, and after the films, they were going to answer questions about dream work. And the audience sent up little kind of cards with all their dreams written out on them. After a few questions, the the main analyst picked up a card that told the story of a recurring dream in which the dreamer was um, tortured and uh, put through the atrocities of the Nazi concentration camps and stripped of all their human dignity. Uh, one of the analysts read this dream out loud. And as they read it out loud, this story is being told by a psychologist who attended the conference, he said, I thought, well, I wonder how they're going to respond to that. I mean, the dream could speak about so much of this woman's own childhood because it was a younger woman and all that, you know, it might portend in her life and so forth. Um, once the dream was read, there was no explanations that were given. Instead, Carl Jung's grandson stood up and he said, would you all please rise? And so the whole room of people rose and he said, we will stand for one minute in silence in response to this dream. And then everyone was invited to sit back down and they went on to the next card and the next dream. Well, the psychologist who was in the audience was frustrated because she had all these interpretations and ideas and why didn't they do anything with this dream? Finally, someone raised their hand and said, Doctor, why is it that none of you analysts had anything to say about that dream of this woman? And Carl Jung's grandson stood up and he said, There is in life a vulnerability so extreme, a suffering so unspeakable, that it goes beyond words. In the face of such suffering, all we can do is stand together in witness, so no one need bear it alone. To become truly mindful of our birth and our aging and our death, of our joys and our sorrows, means to allow the grief of human existence, the, the suffering that inhabits this realm, and the joy equally. The poet Ryokan, the most beloved Zen poet of Japan. Spring has become, begun, jewels and precious gold everywhere. Please come visit me. Only two in the garden, plum blossoms at their peak, and an old man full of years. How can we ever lose interest in life? Spring has come again. The mountains are covered with mist and blooming cherry trees. 
Gaily the warm spring days pass. The children run to greet me the first time this spring, how they have grown. So here is the grief and the sorrows and the joys. We become aware of the body as this human body in its true nature, birth, aging, death, the senses, the life of the body. We become aware of the feelings, feelings in the feelings. We become free when we practice mindfulness of the mind. The mind is such an amazing thing. This is especially the thought mind, you know, and we have picture thoughts and word thoughts. Sometimes on a meditation retreat, I'll just have people count their thoughts. See how many thoughts you can count in one sitting. Hundreds of thoughts. It's phenomenal how many thoughts come trooping through. Thought is a wonderful servant. It is a very poor master. Lama Yeshe <clears throat> puts it this way. To become your own psychologist, you don't have to learn some big philosophy or go to graduate school. All you have to do is examine your own mind. You already examine material things every day. Every morning you check out what food is found in your kitchen, but you never investigate your own mind. Checking out what's in your mind is more helpful. <laughs> and what you begin to discover as you pay attention to the mind is that the mind has no pride. It will do anything. It tells phenomenal stories. It's full of ideas and plans and memories and opinions. <clears throat> and that the reality of your experience is not the same as your thoughts of it. The invitation of mindfulness is to come into the reality. The thought of your mother is not your mother, right? They are different things. But you have this thought and then the whole huge story comes. The Zen ancestor says, the great way is not difficult for those who do not cling to their opinions, who can see things as they are. In our mind are so many ideas about how the world's supposed to be. Story for you. One day, the manager of the store heard his salesman say, no man, we haven't had any for weeks now, and it doesn't look like we'll be getting any soon. Horrified, the manager rushed over, took the arm of the woman, said, That isn't true, ma'am. Of course we'll have some soon. We placed an order for it a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and then he grabbed the salesman and dragged him to the side and growled, Never, never, never say we don't have something. If we don't have it, say we've ordered it and it's on its way. Now, what was it that she wanted? <laughs> Rain, he answered. <laughs> <laughs> the poet Hafiz talks about ending your mental lawsuits, right? Chogyam Trumpa talks about stepping out of the bureaucracy of ego, which is all the constructs that we make about who we are and how it's supposed to be. And instead, with the mind, observing the mind, seeing all the thought constructions, which is what the mind does. It just secretes thoughts. It's an organ that secretes things. It secretes thoughts, and you say, oh, that's very interesting. There's a happy thought or a sad thought or whatever. Don't believe it. I mean, it's very unreliable. I'm sure you've noticed that already. With the mind becoming aware of the mind. Tremendous freedom comes when we're not identified with the mind. And then mindfulness of the dharmas. Mindfulness of the dharmas. From Krishnamurti, dharma is the word that means the laws, the way things are, the truth. To understand truth, one must have a very sharp, precise, clear mind. Not a cunning mind, nor an ambitious mind but a mind that is capable of looking without distortion, a mind that is innocent, open, vulnerable. Only such a mind can see what is true. Learning, deep learning, has a radical openness 
to this moment and this and this. The invitation again is to see the Dharma in the Dharmas, to see the laws of things in our direct experience. The Buddha goes on to notice when the mind is expanded, to notice when it's contracted, to notice when the mind and body and heart are entangled, to notice when they are free. To allow ourselves to rest, is the invitation, to rest in the space of pure awareness, to swim in it, to relax in mindfulness, to become aware of consciousness itself. Because as you start to see thoughts come and go, and feelings changing like the weather, and sensations of the body rising and passing, and days and nights coming and going, the body and mind are doing what it does, from the place of awareness then it can feel like, okay, I'm the witness. I'm the one who sees all of this. It's a certain step to sense that. But then, if you turn your awareness back to say, well, who is this witness? Who am I who's looking? Look for a moment. See, who is it that's listening just now? When you look really directly, you begin to discover that nobody's listening, that there's nobody there. What you find is openness, is space, is a consciousness that is knowing without a single person being there. Not me or mine. This is my sound. This is my feeling but just a pure, open awareness. And this freedom that is discovered by all who look comes in any moment we realize, oh, I took it all to be mine. I took it all very seriously. Here, the words of the Buddha. When body and mind dissolve, they do not exist anywhere any more than musical notes lay heaped up anywhere. When a lute is played, there is no previous store of sound, and when the music ceases, it does not go anywhere in space. It came into existence on account of the wood and the structure of the instrument and the exertions of the performer, and as it came into existence, so it passes away. In exactly the same way, all the elements of your own being, physical, feelings, perceptions, mental, come into existence, having not been existent, arise due to certain causes, and then pass away. There is no self residing in body and mind but the cooperation of all these co-formations produces what people think is me or mine. Paradoxical though it may seem, there is a path to walk on, but no one there who travels it. There are deeds being done, but no one who can claim them. There is the blowing of the air, but there is no wind person who blows it. The thought of who you are, of this self, is an error, an artifact. And as you pay deep attention, all existence becomes hollow as a bubble, as an echo, a rainbow, a flash of lightning, in a summer cloud, a dream. This is not a philosophy that someone is supposed to believe or not believe. It is really an invitation to look into this human experience. Where is your childhood? It is gone. What happened to the 20th century? Went out with a bang, more or less, right? Gone. Never to happen again. Phenomenal. I mean, it was quite a century, huh? Remember that? All that's left is just an imagination. It is gone. This moment is here, and then it is gone. Reality comes out of nothing, exists according to certain patterns, and then disappears. To know this frees us. To not know it, we are bound. It brings us face to face with the mystery. Mindfulness could also be called, by one Zen master, is called, don't know mind. Not knowing, not claiming. 
And there's a real happiness in not knowing. Who are you? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yes, I know my zip code and my phone number. <clears throat> but who are you really? I don't know. Oh, well, how about being in that not knowing? It's wonderful to meet somebody who's open like that. And the masters that I most loved, the ones that I studied with, um, they were so joyful. And it wasn't by being something, I'm an important master. They were just present and happy. They didn't cling to being someone. They were just alive. To train in mindfulness is to remind the heart and mind that we can be free. And it brings a wonderful balance. We stop the struggle the minute we become mindful. You know, there you are with your teenager, right? Or with your partner or whatever it happens to be. Yes. And then, um, you know, you're all conflicted about something. And then in a moment, with mindful attention, you can say, wow, I'm really caught in this, aren't I? Really caught in that one. And in that, just that moment's attention, like a bubble. Oh, I really, I wanted it to be that way. I hated that. I could never forgive that. Oh, I was really caught in there. And then it's gone. When you're sitting in meditation and your knee begins to ache and your back hurts and you're, oh, I'm getting older and God, what's going to happen? And then you start to worry about your money and pretty soon you're, you know, a shopping bag lady out on the streets, you know, and it's only five minutes from when your knee began to hurt and you have this whole life scenario. <laughs> and then you wake up and you say, caught in that one, wasn't I? San Master Ryokan never preached to or reprimanded anyone. Once his brother asked Ryokan to visit his house and speak to his delinquent teenage son. This is in the 1700s in Japan, just so you know that certain things are eternal. <laughs> Ryokan came but did not say a word of admonition to the boy. He stayed overnight and prepared to leave the next morning. And as the wayward nephew... Help Ryokan place sandals on his feet. He felt a warm drop of water. Glancing up, he saw Ryokan looking down at him, his eyes full of tears. Ryokan returned home, and the nephew changed very much for the better. There is a tenderness in this attention, a sweetness and compassion that comes because we're not trying to get or be something. We can see this person this plant, this car that's moving in the traffic pattern that we're in, as they are now, and not with all our ideas and judgments and ambitions. It is so free. And this liberation is both practical and radical. It's practical, you know, the story I like to tell of the army officer who was studying meditation for stress reduction in his army unit. It happens now, you know. It's gone beyond these weird Buddhist places. Mainstream. Mainstream entry. And uh, so there he was in line at the grocery store with all these groceries in a hurry, always in a hurry, trying to get somewhere and very irritable. And then a woman in line in front of him he noticed had just one item and she wouldn't get in the express line she was waiting in his line why didn't she go in the line that was meant for people like her you know how it is and then she got up to the cash register she was carrying a baby and she handed the baby to the cashier and they were cooing over and you know coochie coo nice baby the guy was just going ballistic <laughs> Hurry up, I'm in a hurry, you're in the wrong line, you don't you see there are all these people and so forth. But because he'd begun to study mindfulness, he felt how much tension he was making. And he took some breaths. And he just let all that frustration and anger soften a bit. And then he looked for a moment, he saw it was actually kind of a cute baby. <laughs> so he gets to the cash register. He'd released all of that tension, or some of it. And he said, you know, that was a really cute kid that she was carrying, that woman, before me. And the cashier said, oh, did you like him? He's my son. You see, my husband was in the Air Force, but he was killed in a plane crash this last year. 
So I've had to come to work and my mother takes care of our baby, but she brings him in once or twice a day so I can see him. We have so many stories about who's doing what and how they're supposed to be. Liberation is so immediate. There we are and then we can let go. It's also quite radical. A poem from Wendell Berry called The Mad Farmer's Manifesto, which he is. <laughs> Love the quick profit, the annual raise, the vacation with pay. Want more of everything ready-made. Be afraid to know your neighbors and to die, and you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind will be punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. So, my friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the world. Work for nothing. Take all that you have and offer some to the poor. Love someone who doesn't deserve it. <laughs> Ask questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest, that you will not live to harvest. Put your faith in the two inches of soil that build under the trees every thousand years. To become mindful is to become free, to have the capacity to step out of the rat race, the speed, the complexity, and be who we are, be true to our hearts. And there comes a great balance and ease with that. In any moment, we stop the war, we stop the conflict, we come back to be as the Buddha sits, as the Buddha walks, as the Buddha speaks, where we are, just present and alive. <clears throat> so simple to be with things as they are. A silly poem for you. Once upon a time, this is from Bob, Bob Munson, once upon a time, before time was invented, there was no daytime or nighttime, and yesterday, today, and tomorrow weren't here yet. There were no watches, clocks, sundials, no hours, minutes, days, seconds, years. There was no fast or slow, and everything just was the way it was when it was that way. And things happened in no time. They just happened when they did. Flowers bloomed when they did. Morning and evening just came and went. <laughs> Once upon that time, there lived a frog who lived in no time. He wasn't fast or slow. When he jumped, he jumped. And when he didn't, he didn't. He got to where he was going in no time. Because in no time, it took no time to get anywhere. And anywhere was everywhere. So he was really where he wanted to be all the time. And he was always on time wherever he went. He got where he was going before he left. <laughs> he didn't have to rush or hurry, because in no time he could never be late. Wouldn't that be fine to live in no time and be where you are all the time? It's really natural to us. This is not foreign. It's as near to us as our own breath, as near to us as our own body. And when we practice mindfulness, we come alive. Our bodies come alive, our senses, our food tastes different because we actually taste it. The people around us, their eyes, their spirits are alive for us. Our words become more alive. The clouds and the earthworms, as Mad Bear said. Our silence is more alive. We're present when we come. We're present when we go. We're aware for birth, and we're aware of death, of joys and sorrows. We enter that which is timeless. What a gift. 
even a few moments a day is great. Practice is not to make perfect, but to remember that freedom is possible where we are, that our heart can open in this very life, in this very moment. The body in the body, the feelings in the feeling, the thoughts in the thought. You discover the body lives its own life. The feelings feel themselves. The thoughts think themselves. So we sit in meditation. It's really just a little reminder, reminding meditation. We feel the breath. And the mind quiets and the heart opens. And things start to open up. All the things that come and go. My teacher, Nisargadot, used to talk about it this way. He said, usually we only see a small distance bound by our desires for what we like, our ambitions, and our fears and dislikes of what's wrong with this world. We create a net that entangles us, confines and limits our consciousness. This is not who we are. To free ourselves, it is necessary to look beyond the net. And yet it is simple, for the net is full of holes. Any moment we look, any moment we bring mindfulness to, there's space, there's openness. We're not entangled and identified. And there's a tremendous joy in discovering this and remembering this. Mindfulness is kind of like Sabbath. You know, six days you work and then you get a day off. Actually, in the old... Um, testament as it was written not only was there a sabbath every seventh day where you got to rest and just appreciate life and not have to do stuff but every seventh year was a fallow year where things were not planted and you got a whole year a sabbatical right a year off doesn't that sound fine and every seventh seventh year in the grand cycle all property was returned to its original owners. All debts were forgiven. It was like Monopoly. Okay, we did it for 49 years, and now we go back to square one again. Isn't that great? Mindfulness is like that. Go directly to go. You know, do not go to, do not go to jail. No, let's go to directly to jail. Do not pass go. It's the opposite. Like get out of jail free card is what it is. There's an ease, there's a graciousness when we remember this mindfulness or heartfulness where we can bow to this life as it is with its joys and its sorrows. And we somehow sense the small sense of self, the body of fear that we talk about, the ambitions and confusions. And remember, that's not really what it's about. It's not who we are. Like Zen Master Suzuki Roshi, when he was dying of cancer, called everyone together. If when I die, if I suffer, that's all right, you know. That's just suffering, Buddha. No confusion in it. Maybe everyone will suffer for the physical or spiritual agony. If when I die, if I suffer, that's all right, you know. That's just suffering, Buddha. Moon Buddha, Sun Buddha, Happy Buddha, Sad Buddha. The way things are is what we are given to awaken to. Through mindfulness, we can bow to what is and be free. The words, the Dhammapada, the Buddha. How can they lose the way? who are beyond the way. Their eyes are open. Their feet are free. Who can follow after them? For the one who is awake, attentive, mindful, the world cannot reclaim them or lead them astray, nor can the net of desires hold them. They are awake. Even the gods delight in watching over them. There's not one moment that you're far away from this freedom. 
O nobly born, it said, O you who are the sons and daughters of the Buddha, remember your own true nature. Remember that you can awaken and be free. Remember the path of awakening, this eightfold path of wise understanding, the potential for liberation and compassion in your own being, of wise intention to bring your awareness and care just where you are, of wise speech, action, and livelihood to make the very words and deeds of your life the place of practice, the place of awakening, of wise effort, the effort to stay awake and present, of wise concentration, that wholeness of heart and body and mind when we come into the present, of wise mindfulness, that ability to be present and let go into the great space of awareness that neither struggles nor resists, but is free in the midst of all things. Just as if, my friends, one who was faring through the forest, through the great woods, should see an ancient path, an ancient road traversed by people of former days, even so have I, O monks, seen an ancient path, an ancient road traversed by the rightly enlightened ones of former times, and it is this road that I invite you to, to walk. You can't do it wrong, you know. Either you're present or you're not. Either you're awake or you've forgotten. And then a moment later, oh, here we are again. It's great. You can't make a mistake in that way. The path is immediate. It's inviting. It's generous. You are invited to participate, to remember, to follow the path of the awakened ones, to develop the heart of compassion, to quiet the mind, open the heart, to taste your own freedom. I end with a little chant. And this chant is an offer of gratitude or appreciation for your attention over these weeks and for the care that so many people in this room give to their lives, those around them. So PTO we watch unto, Saparo ko we nasa tu, Made po wad wantarayo, Tsukiti kayu koboa, Abi watana sile sanichang, Uta bacha hino, Chadaru tamma watandi, Ayuano sukang palang.